You have created a monster and it will destroy you. She's alive! Alive! I am Dracula. Hey, welcome to Monster Manor. This is another special. I know it's in the in the middle of the week here. Uh, normally, we're a Saturday show, but this is for very special reasons. Uh, first of all, we're getting all ready for uh, Phantasm coming up on the 19th through the 21st. And as a result, I get to have some really cool people on here a little bit more often than I usually do. So tonight's show, though, first, if your sum total knowledge of the paranormal is these guys here, we've got a treat for you because everyone loves Ghostbusters. Everyone loves that, that lore, but there's a very serious side to that. And to explain this to us and give us a little bit of history and play, especially it's Bill Slevin from Purse or the Paranormal Existence Research Society. And he's got some friends with him too. Um, so we're going to meet all of these people and get a little more familiar with uh, paranormal events and, and all about that. So without further ado, I welcome to our show, uh, Bill Slavin, Chris McKinnell, Joe Frankie, and of course, I'm the ugly one in the corner here. But thank you guys for coming on. I know, uh, Chris, you're, you're not even in the country, so thank you for uh, coming on as well. It's my pleasure. I'm actually right outside of Machu Picchu in uh, Peru. Wow. So I think you are definitely our, our longest away, our farthest away, um, you know, guest. So thank you for doing this. I know it's a little bit difficult being in another place and, you know, technology and, and stuff like that. But um, I am looking forward to Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing each one of you at Phantasm in, in just about nine days now. So um, I'm going to start with Bill. Uh, Bill, you are um, you are an interesting individual because I did my homework on you as well. And you are a, a, a paranormal researcher. Explain to me what the difference is between that and, say, uh, you know, someone that's doing paranormal studies or what does that specifically entail as a researcher? Well, first of all, can you hear me? Because I see I'm frozen on the screen. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. So um, a paranormal researcher is, you know, when we go out and we do, say, residential cases or, you know, even public cases, we're not just going out and having fun and trying to find ghosts and all that. We're actually trying to take in the actual research so that we can... Uh, keep it. Chris has a big database that he keeps everything into, so that we can see, like, when this case occurred, the, what was the moon phase? What was, you know, trying to piece everything together to try to help, kind of further the industry a little bit and and get a little more true evidence. Hmm. Yeah, and I think that's that's probably the hardest thing is just overcoming a lot of the skepticism with. Um, you know, when you say paranormal or, or ghosts or anything like that, you have the two sides. You have the people who have actually lived those events and and seen that. And I've seen it firsthand since I was probably about uh, 15, 16 years old. Um, and I noticed that everyone else on the screen here has a similar story. So if we go back, um, you know, starting again with Bill, with with your first um, your first experience with the paranormal what got you interested in in learning more about it well even from when i was a little kid um i didn't realize that i had 
some abilities. I'm, I'm an empath and I could sense things. But when I was young, when I started over 30 years ago, there was nobody really out there talking about it as much. Now, there wasn't mm. those, there wasn't everything. So anybody you talked to thought you were crazy. So mm. I was always into horror. I was always into paranormal. I wanted a, but when I watched a movie or I heard something, I didn't want to just see it. I wanted to learn more about it. I wanted to know what happened, why it happened. So it kind of got me, you know, interested more in trying to search out people that were into it and find out exactly, you know, what was going on a little more than, than just being scared on watching a horror movie. Mm. Right. And your parents were fairly open to it as well, I assume. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. Um, I mean, they didn't mind, but they they're my mother to this day still doesn't really believe, even though I've been doing this over 30 years. Uh, I was raised Catholic and I don't know. They just, they just, you know what it is? I truly believe if she's listening, she'll probably say something to my mother. I truly believe that she doesn't believe because when my grandmother passed away, her mother, we were all very close. She feels that if there was a, a, a spirit world out there where people could come and that my grandmother would be there talking to her and she's mm -hmm. never had any of that. I don't think she's open to it really to really mm -hmm. understand, but I think that's why she doesn't believe as much. See, I definitely want to come back to that a little bit later in the conversation about why some people mm -hmm. when they pass, don't, you know, you don't hear from them and then others are real upset. So uh, I will come back to that. Um, I believe the next person I want to talk to is Chris. We'll give him a, a chance to talk. And I know he's going to apologize for his audio in advance. So if it has a little echo, just be patient. Again, he's in Peru. Um, but Chris, you have a very special connection very to special the paranormal. Uh, could you paranormal. explain that to uh, the listener? Uh, well, you know, I, I, I always think it's kind of funny that... Uh, you know, people think it's special that I've got grandparents. We all have them. But uh, my grandparents are Ed and Lorraine Warren from The Conjuring and Annabelle and everything else. And uh, I started working with my grandparents uh, 42 years ago when I was 16. And I've uh, been doing it ever since. I am the director of the Warren Legacy Foundation, which all of these gentlemen are members of. Um, and they're two of my very best, actually. Um, and I honestly, I work for them. They don't work for me. Uh, they do. They do the. They do the heavy lifting. Very cool. And Very Joe, cool. I know you came into it around what year? Eighteen of your life. Life. Yeah, I was uh, eighteen years old when I met Ed and Lorraine Warren. Um, we, my wife, my wife. Well, my wife now, but we were dating at the time. That's how long we've been together. Uh, saw in a local newspaper that the Warrens are going to be having a presentation at um, uh, Holiday Inn uh, down the road in the next town over. Uh, it was a Friday evening, and she said, hey, it sounds interesting. You want to go? And I'm like, yeah, I've heard of the Warrens and the Amityville case and uh, things like that um, and seen them on television. And I said, yes, yeah, so we'll go. So we're walking in, and Lorraine was at, at the table uh, taking, taking the money to, and giving the tickets and things. And she kind of cocks her head to the side, and she's looking at me. And she says, honey, have we met before? And I, I said, no, Lorraine, I've heard a lot about you guys, but, you know, we've, we've never met. Um, and she, she's looking at me, and I later found out she was reading my aura. And she's uh -huh. like, there's a reason why you're here tonight. She goes, she goes, can you see Ed and I after the show? I want to talk to you. So, you know, here I am. Like, I can barely keep a, a straight thought in my head and sit, sit still in my seat. So... We go through the presentation, and uh, at the end of the night, um, you know, they packed up, and, and we went to the diner across the street. And she's sitting across from me, and she's holding my hands, and she's reading my aura, and she's like, honey, you were meant to do this work. She's like, I can tell. She says, would you like to come and work with us? And I, I'm like, yeah, I'd love it. So that's how it all started with the Warrens and I. And they, as Chris mentioned, they're, they're, they're grandparents. I mean, they're like typical grandparents, you know? Um, yeah. I, I considered them my adopted grandparents and, uh, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. I met Chris. We've been friends ever since, um, worked on many, many cases together. And I was mentored by 
the best, you know, and uh, came up through the ranks. And I tell you, a lot of people ask me when I lecture, like, well, weren't you scared? I go, yeah, I was scared. Mm-hmm. You know, at the time I was 350 pounds, a, you know, weightlifter, black belt, you know, not scared of anyone mm-hmm. <laughs> walking the earth anyway. You know, I, I tell you, my first experience we, when we went out to a cemetery to take psychic photographs, it was during the daytime. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had bought a brand new camera. Uh, Bill would appreciate this. I bought a b- brand new camera for this occasion. And I'm out there and Ed's explaining how to take photographs, load the film on site, all that stuff. And about, you know, halfway through my roll, Ed looks at me. He goes, Joe, you got to take the lens cap off. <laughs> I was so nervous. <laughs> I was so nervous and green, you know. Yeah. So uh, that's that's how it all started, you know. Well, they sounded like amazing people. I mean, I was, like I said, doing the research, you get to know people on a different level than just what you read, you know, what the normal people would read in in articles and stuff. But I I saw that Lorraine was kind of a little bit more exuberant and out there, and Ed was a little more grounded, but that they fed off each other really well with that sort of thing. What was it like coming up with them and learning all they knew? Because, I mean, they... Probably one of the earliest things that I remember as a kid, of course, was like the Amityville Horror. And I found out that they went out there, or you probably went out there, and actually investigated the Amity House uh, and with them. I didn't. I was only six years old. Six years old. <laughs> and I was only 14. So, no. I, I started at 16, so no. Uh, but it was it was the case that brought my grandparents the, the first international recognition and um it was an extraordinary case i have to say you know you hear a lot of stories about things like uh jay anson the the author of the amityville horror uh mm-hmm. and the lutzes and their lawyer were sitting around drinking wine and making all of this up that's ridiculous mm-hmm. um my grandparents were invited into that house by channel 5 news not by the family not by anyone else and they had to go to um, Kathy Lutz's mother's house to get the keys because the Lutzes wouldn't go anywhere near that house. After they fled, they wanted nothing to do with it. They left coin collections, gun collections, all the furniture, all of the food, all of the clothing, everything behind. They left. They wanted nothing. The only thing George Lutz asked for was uh, the deed to the house. Mm-hmm. He asked my grandfather for the deed so they get rid of it so they'd never have to deal with it again. Yeah. And uh, there's a very famous photo. Well, there are a number of famous photos from that house, but one of them takes place. Um, one of the news photographers was on the landing mm-hmm. uh, on the staircase and he took a picture of the um, one of the bedrooms. Now he didn't see a damn thing. And yet there's this child well, it looks like a child looking out at him. And there were no children in that house. The thing mm. is, if you really look, mm. the eyes are blazing white. It is not a child. Now, my grandparents said it was a demon. I'm not so convinced, but it's certainly an extremely negative, negative place. And the reporter that was in that house with my grandparents has followed up with all of the uh, owners since then. Mm-hmm. And most of them have had horrific experiences. Very few last in that home for more than a couple of years. Well, uh, well, I mean, I mean, if you believe what you read, I mean that there was some very uh, intense things that happened there. You know, it's not just because we see kind of the sequel in Amityville because there was a whole story of what happened before what we saw in Amityville Horror. This family was terrorized, yes, but what happened before was the horror. I mean, that was horrific. That was Ron DeFeo. He murdered Ron DeFeo Jr. murdered his entire family at three fifteen at in the morning. Um, his father had gone up to Montreal to the cathedral up there, had bought a bunch of religious statues, brought them back, surrounded the house, and when neighbors asked him why, he said. I've got a demon on my back. And they all assumed they meant Ron DeFeo Jr., who was a known heroin addict and, uh, you know, had his own issues. Mm -hmm. Um, But the thing is, every single person in that household was murdered laying face down in the bed. 
and shot with a shotgun. Now, if a shotgun is going off in your home, are you going to stay in bed laying face down? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My belief is they all suffered from something known as psychic paralysis, sleep paralysis, or phantom mania. And they, they knew what was going on. They just couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So is it your observation that it's possible that whatever evil existed that, that drove DeFeo to do that, that existed prior to them even moving in there? Yes. According to my grandfather and his research, this goes back actually far, far longer, far many, many decades earlier. Um, now, he also seemed to think it went back even into... Uh, Native American lands, they refused mm -hmm. to bury people on that land. They refused to cross that land. They said it was evil. Uh, now, I don't know that. I've not actually done the research myself, so I, I don't want to state that, yes, this is what is true. Um, mm -hmm. but that is what my grandfather said. Wow. Well, Ed I, told me uh, a story, me a story um, um, about the, the basement. Um, he said, Joe, he said, I went down in the basement, but he was by himself. And, um, he said something came over him. It was like taking a wet blanket and throwing it on him. Mm. And he, and he went down on the ground and it, he said, I, I always keep a bottle of holy water in my pocket. And he took the holy water out and he sp spring it around and, and, and this, uh, whatever this was, it lifted off of him. He said, Joe, I never touched the stairs. He goes, I wouldn't go back in that house for any amount of money. He said, I believe that that house is the gateway to hell. And he wow. did tell me that they found a makeshift wall in the basement that contained uh, an area of um, satanic worship. Worship. So, Chris, maybe you can back me up there. But, you know, Pentagram and, and our answer was. And it was as close to hell as she ever hoped to get. Yep, she did say that. Man, see, that's that's see, the that's, reality of this is reality, that we yeah, see the movies, reality. but these yeah, were based on on real events. And I mean, it's got to be weird for for you guys that have been in this for so long to see things that you actually did. And now they're making movies out of them. But did they um, did they over dramatize the movies, or did they keep it fairly close to what what you wanted to tell as far as the stories went? Hollywood, once they have a story, is going to do what they want with it. Uh, if you look at the Conjuring movies, the first one's pretty good. The second and third, yeah, they're all based on real cases, but they are not true to the details. Um, there, for instance, in Conjuring 2, Amityville and Enfield, England, are combined with this monster known as the Nun. The Nun is completely a James Wan fabrication. There's nothing real about it whatsoever. Um, and the truth is, the Enfield case was far more horrific than what was portrayed in the Conjuring movie. My grandmother going through a, a, a flooded uh, basement, my grandfather hanging from the, uh, the window, holding on to a child, none of that happened. That's ridiculous. Um, but there's a child that's in the movie who had a stammer. Um, I th his name was Billy. And he aged to death in a number of weeks, not months. There, now, there's a disease called progeria where a person will age to death. And, you know, by the time they're 20, they look 80. No, this boy was 12 years old. And all of a sudden, he was an old man. And as they were bringing his body by horse-drawn carriage to the church, the voices were screaming at passers-by, swearing at them, throwing rocks at people. And when they brought the coffin to the front of the, in front of the altar, the body, the coffin was flipped open and the body spilled out on the floor. That mm. really happened. Mm. And it's not in the movie at all. Yeah. And that seems much more horrific the, than just the... Oh, go, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Joe. No, I'm sorry. I just uh, wanted to tag on to that. I remember uh, shortly after the release of the first Conjuring movie, uh, I was uh, sitting in the kitchen, Lorraine's kitchen at the table, and we were talking about the movie, and she looked at me. I was talking about this uh, a particular scene, and she looked at me, and she goes, oh, honey, that never happened. That didn't happen. That was all Hollywood. 
you know, they get mm -hmm. they have to beef it up to make it more palatable for their viewers, and they got to put butts in the seats. I get that, yeah. you know. But um, you know, when you whenever I see a movie that's air quotes based on a true story, you know, um, you, you just got to take it with a grain of salt. But uh, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be that that whole based, and, and just like reality television shows, um, which I do want to get on with uh, Bill on uh, because he was he and I had a conversation, a short conversation about that as well. Um, but are we up for our commercial break? Is that where we are yeah, now? I have, I have questions. And then we have a question. A question and then a question. Okay, question first. Can we ask this, guys? This is from Stephanie. I don't know if you can read that. Do you think Mr. Lutz was accurate in the occult when he lived in the house? Not according to anything I know. The man was a hell's angel type. He was a rough, tough guy. He was not very nice to the kids that were his wife's children. Um, I know that um, one of the children uh, is horribly damaged, has actually threatened members of the Warren Legacy Foundation. Um, you know, myself included, uh, because he thought we were involved with the Amityville movies, which we're not. Um, but no, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that the Lutzes had anything to do with the occult. Hmm. Okay, thank you for taking the time to answer that. Um, we are going to have a quick break. Uh, right. Commercial announcements. We'll come back and we'll uh, continue our interview with Bill Slevin and his guests, Chris McKinnell and Joe Frankie. in just one moment. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Michelucci, the Don of the Dead Scope Zombie. And I'm Dee Michelucci, Zombie Mom from the Night of Living Dead and 30th Anniversary Edition. And we're both excited and looking forward to having a great time in Orlando this summer, this August at Phantasm Orlando. Can't wait to meet all our fans and hope we'll see you soon. Make sure to check out their website and their Facebook page and order your tickets today. And we will see you soon. Thanks. Hey everyone, Mike Christopher here, the Hari Krishna zombie from the original Dawn of the Dead. Just want to make sure everybody knows that I'm going to be at Phantasm in Orlando, August 19, 20, and 21. So make sure you're there, and I'll see you then. All righty. So for those of you that are joining us now, we're waiting on Bill to come back. We had some technical, back. We had some technical to uh, take care of. Um, but we are also with uh, Joe Frankie and Chris McKennell. Uh, both of these gentlemen are, 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 are very, you know, very uh, Aware, uh, of, aware of, of legacy, of um, legacy. Um, they work with them for most of their lives. Most so of their this lives. is a so rare treat this for fans, rare of treat for fans of and, and uh, the paranormal uh, studies in general. Um, so we've talked a little bit in the last um, few in the last segment about the tie-ins to movies and how a lot of what they went through and lived through and investigated wound up in movies. Um, there are questions that come from that. So I'm going to throw this one at Bill. Um, as far as, um, you know, with the, the occult and the paranormal, um, you know, is there a difference between those phrases that we often hear, the paranormal, the um, parapsychological, all of those things? Do they have different meanings in your research? Um, well, I mean, they all kind of tie in at times. Uh, you know, the occult... It, it's just I don't know how to explain that one. <laughs> um, they all kind of they all kind of tie in. I mean, a lot of cases that we get, where mm -hmm. at least for me, when we go and deal with people and it's something bad, it comes from somebody practicing the occult or using a Ouija board or doing something like that. I mean, they all kind of tie in. I mean, uh, what, do you, what do you what do you have to add to that? Because I know. Anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah I can now, um, Bill. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I you know, through the years I've learned in, in speaking with the clergy, and uh, I remember uh, Father Gary Thomas, who was the uh, exorcist featured in the movie in the book The Right, 
Mm. Um, I'd mentioned he's like, you know, there has to be a way in, uh, an opening where these things get in, whether it be a Ouija board, a seance, a spirit box session. Basically, the way I explain it is you're opening your front door and saying, come on in, mm. you're, you know, welcome. But you don't know what you're letting in. You know, I've had people, I've had Ouija board cases and people will say, oh, Joe, it's no big deal. It's it's the spirit of a little girl we made contact with. I said, that's what it wants you to believe because it wants yeah, to right. lure you in and gain your trust. And once it's in, it's really hard to get rid of. But there has to be a way in. And, and there's many ways of doing that where um, I'm currently helping a colleague uh, out in the West area um, with, a, with a client who lost his grandmother and he was very, very close to his grandmother. And he was, he, he turned away from God and he turned away from the church as he explains it. And he literally, try, he said he tried to do the eulogy and he, and he got it, you know, one sentence in and he ran outside and just started screaming at God and, and cursing at him and blaming God for taking his grandmother. And he turned to the occult and he started to basically in short, make a deal with the devil to get his grandmother back. Now, if that's not an opening, I don't know what is. And now he's yeah. having some serious problems. You know, it's yeah. a very new case, and we're working on it. Obviously, I'm not going to give any particulars, but um, that's a prime example of, of you allowing something in either either consciously or, or, or you know unconsciously, letting something in to your life. And it can affect you. It could affect the ones you love. It could affect your finances, right. your job. It wants to destroy you. It right. wants to destroy you. And well, you bring, very, very good, uh, you bring up a very good. You bring up a very good thought, though, you know, because back in I don't know if it was the '70s, maybe late '60s, Milton Bradley put out Ouija, you know, Ouija, and and you could go into the store, anyone could buy this, and in some ways, if you believed in this stuff, yeah. which a lot of people did, it's like putting a, a loaded gun in the hand of a toddler. Well, you know, it, it is just a board game. However, it's the context However, in which you use that game. If you're, that you're game. looking, if you're using the game to conjure spirits, it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Very dangerous. Go ahead, Chris. Very dangerous. Well, there are a couple of things here. I'd, I'd like to draw a, a definition between the occult and the paranormal first. Uh, the occult is about practice. It's about intention. It's about trying to contact something supernatural. But the paranormal can be many, many different things. It could be psychic abilities out of control. It could be tapping into energies in the home, uh, creating poltergeist phenomena. It could be many other things that are not necessarily a cult. Um, and the Ouija board or spirit boxes or EVPs or whatever you're using, it doesn't really matter. What matters is your intention to make contact. You're opening yourself up. And if you are someone who is particularly negative or has an underlying condition or vulnerability, a negativity that alcohol will addiction, attract alcoholism. that bad thing, then yes, absolutely, it's incredibly dangerous. Most people use these things and nothing ever happens. But teenagers in particular, because you know their emotions are very high, very volatile, uh, when they use the Ouija board, they get results. And unfortunately, because those emotions are high and often negative and they're depressed or what have you, they can attract something that can be really, really harmful to them. Yeah, yeah I, I'd like yeah. to add. Yes. Um, it's funny because that's exactly I, when I'm at conventions and speaking and doing lectures, it's probably one of the most asked questions mm -hmm. is about. Why is the Ouija board so dangerous? And I tell them exactly kind of what Chris said. It's no different than any equipment we use. It's all about your intent and what you're doing with it. I always say a lot of people that use a Ouija board are usually using it because they just lost somebody and mm -hmm. they're trying to contact them. But they don't realize they're not talking to them. They're, they're opening it up to something else. And that's where that's the problem. You know, uh, it, it's not about, uh, uh, you know, a board. Before that, people used to use a Ouija board on a table. They just draw it out, put a cup on the table, and it's the same thing. So it's mm -hmm. not the board. It's, it's what you're doing with it. Yeah. It uh, looks like we have another 
question that came through from our watchers. There's a trend on the internet. Oh, this is Boris. He's okay. he's at the okay. master's house. Uh, there's a trend on the internet where influencers will buy and open dry book spelling boxes. Dubuque, not dry book. What is no, that? Dubuque. Oh, Dubuque uh, boxes. How dangerous is this to encourage that behavior? Um, <laughs> it's it's a divot box, and it's a uh, uh, a very bad thing to open. <laughs> I'm sure everybody here will agree with me. They're known. Um, I'm trying to remember how to explain this. They were like, uh, what's his name? Zach has one in his museum that hmm. it's, it, it's supposed to contain the spirits or the demons of something, I believe. And it's it sealed and stayed closed for a reason to keep it trapped in there. People right. should not open them up. I'm, People on TikTok, though, I will say, a lot of them that find these things, they're not real divot boxes. They're people just playing jokes on them. But they're not really something you should ever open and and play with because you don't know what's in it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, divot boxes are actually Jewish, and it's a troubled spirit that's supposed to be trapped in there. When they don't, the Jewish tradition doesn't believe in demons. So they do believe, though, in troubled spirits that can cause harm. And that they had these things that would contain them. Um, but as Bill was saying, and I apologize, Bill, I, I missed part of that because unfortunately I, I, I got dropped for a moment. But um, the truth is 99.9% .9 of the crap that you see for sale that says it's haunted online, Please don't waste your friggin' money. And if it actually is haunted, why would you do that? It's Russian roulette. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you truly don't know what you're getting. It's, it's a crapshoot, you know? And why would you want to release that into your house anyway? That energy. Why take the chance? Well, I, I, I will say, I'm sure they won't like this too much, but we do have coming to Phantasm, I have a, a girl, Kelly who's coming with her haunted item collection, but she calls herself a caretaker. She doesn't, she says she takes care of the spirits within them and she doesn't collect them and she doesn't charge money for anything. And she doesn't do anything for money. She just actually keeps them all in account. They all have pretty interesting backstories to them. But, you know, everybody, everybody has a, a different opinion when it comes to the items. The things you buy on you know, eBay and the things you see on TikTok, most of them are not, not real. Yeah, well, I think very... the worst thing about my parents' legacy is their supposed haunted museum, uh, the occult museum. It's it's not supposed. They actually, the things in there are haunted and they are deadly. Um, but to call it a museum, I think, was the supposed part. It was never open to the public. It was always by special invitation. And today, everybody wants to collect these items. And yeah. what I would tell somebody. If you've got something you suspect is dangerous to you, take it far from any home, dig a hole a foot deep, consecrate the ground with either holy water, blessed salt, whatever, prayers, bury it, consecrate it again, leave, never come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill, you and, know, this is uh, this Bill, kind of leads Bill. into a conversation that we were having about um, you know, going to people that are in a situation like that, where they think they might have something that's either a possessed house or a possessed, you know, article of furniture or something like that. What goes into establishing if that is indeed, a, you know, a supernatural or a paranormal occurrence, or if it's just something that happens? Now, that's where the interesting part is, because this is where you get a lot of teams that are out there that maybe learn from watching TV, they don't know a lot of the other side of it. They just watch TV, they see all the equipment, and they think that the equipment goes off and comes to paranormal. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've learned way before that. And, you know, during the day, I work at a psychiatric uh, alcohol and drug treatment facility. So I've learned a lot about the psychiatric side. I've learned a lot about, uh, I've gone in houses and we found animals in walls that were making noise we found you can find just about anything it's about knowing how to determine that if you walk into somebody's house thinking their house is haunted it's going to be haunted 
Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're not going to you, you have to put your mindset to to take the time to really learn and figure out what is going on. Talk to them. When we do a case, we get on with them for hours and find out every detail about them, about their history, about their mental history, about, you know, everything. And then there's also some some that are uh, mediums and psychics that can, you know, also sense and see what's going on. But it's it's just more about understanding every side of it because it's not always paranormal. It's it's a lot less than people think. Mm. Well, I think we're coming up on our second commercial break here. Are you ready, Miss Producer Lady? Um, we're going to have that real quick. We'll come back and we'll talk about some other particulars of the actual research part of what you guys have to do. Um, so we'll be right back with a little bit more with our friends. I'm Fedor Steer, the bowler hat ghost from Haunting of Hill House, and I need to see you in Orlando at the Phantasm Horror Con, August 19th to the 21st. Don't be afraid. You'll be just fine. Hey guys, Tyler Main here. August 19th through the 21st, I'm going to be at Phantasm in Orlando, Florida. I want to see you guys there. Let's have some fun. Peace. See you there. Phantasm. What's up, everyone? This is Jordan DiNatale from Fear Street. I'm so looking forward to seeing you all at Phantasm in Orlando, August 19th to the 21st. See you all there. So we're back with our friends. We're, we're discussing the paranormal, which I know a lot of people have their misconceptions or their, uh, I guess, uh, their ideas of what it is. But There is a true logic and a true science to this. Um, It isn't Ghostbusters. So I'm glad that we're back with our friends to discuss this a little bit more. And as you saw from all the little trailers we played, uh, this is leading up to Phantasm Orlando uh, next week on the 19th through the 21st. These guys are all going to be there as well. So you'll be able to talk to them in person and get some really good answers to questions beyond what we're covering here. Um, So we talked a little bit about when you go into a house that someone might think, hey, I have a haunting or I have a possession or something like that. Um, Are there any tools other than your mind that you have to use when you're researching this? I'm sure a lot of history goes into it. Um, You can tell by the the videos that you have that you do have some things that you use. uh, But what goes into that? Well, um, there's I have a I have a ton of equipment. I don't use it a lot on residential investigations. When we go out in the public, I'll use a lot of stuff, but use a few things in a home. If, if we do go in there, we may use EMF meters to take baseline readings to see if there's a massive amount of EMF coming out of, you know, uh, their electrical system or something in there just to kind of see what's going on. Um, we use a lot of our own intuition, you know, like when I'm there, I'm an empath, so I could sense I can feel the emotions and the energy of what's in there. I can't see them or speak to them, but I, I could usually feel them. We have other people. You are the tool. You are the, the, yeah. The best mm. tool is yourself. Mm. I'm sure everybody will agree with that one, <laughs> but, um, you know, there, there are a few basic things we always have. I mean, I always have audio and video just to record everything and, uh, cap and just in case you never know what you may capture, but there's a lot of research that goes into, uh, we have researchers that'll research the property and there's a, a million things. And I know Chris will can really go into this about water lines running underneath houses. And there's so many different things that can uh, all come together and, and cause problems in the home. Hmm. Yeah. I'd love to hear more about that, Chris, if you could chime in on that when, when you're researching and, and you find all those little things that can change the direction of a, a, a your research instantly, right? 
half of our job is diagnosing the issue, uh, mm -hmm. really, because if I, I know these gentlemen can back me up on this, the horror stories we get from uh, teams who come in and say, oh my God, you've got a demon, we can't deal with that, bye. The reality is you do that to a family, they will manifest their fears. We have an extraordinary ability to manifest things ourselves. We don't need spirits to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I personally am a psychic. I, I'm, I have some medium, mediumship abilities. Uh, I am a strong empath, uh, a bit of a clairvoyant. I, I don't like labeling very much. I think it's very self-limiting, but mm -hmm. um, I don't trust psychics. I don't trust me without evidence ever because what I'm dealing with is people's lives. And I've seen people killed in this field. And I see the, the cowboys out there wanting to get their 15 minutes of fame and do their videos. And then they leave, whether it's television programs or YouTube or TikTok or Instagram or whatever the hell it is that people do nowadays. I'm, I'm old, I don't know. Um, Everyone's no. trying to make a name for themselves. Yeah. And I, I've been doing this 42 years. Nobody knows who the heck I am. I'm only up front now because my grandparents are gone. I have no mm -hmm. choice. You know, if you want to get help, you have to know where to come that's reputable. And that's right. these gentlemen here. That these are the great people that we work with. You know, um, but really, 90% of what we deal with is psychological or fear. Mm. Um, you know, either they're using drugs or alcohol or domestic abuse or just plain old fear. They've been watching too many paranormal programs and they think the footsteps in the hallway are the devil when it's just your grandmother come to visit to see if you're okay. You know, education is a great way of dealing with this. We, we, dis we, we, we disperse the, the fear. We bring in actual knowledge and Nine times out of 10, when people understand that what they're dealing with isn't actually out to hurt them, mm -hmm. that really makes a huge difference. You know, teaching them how to clean their home, get rid of the clutter, play music that makes them laugh and dance and sing, play comedies that make them want to laugh, not arguing in the home, maybe mm -hmm. getting counseling if they're having problems in their home. These things will help raise the the vibrations of the home and get rid of that negativity that may be manifesting that more often than not is the easiest way to deal with these problems mm. it's it's not flashy i'm not you know yes i've look the haunting in connecticut movie that was my case you know um satan's harvest which was frenchy from the nun that was my case you know i've dealt with the horrors mm. but they're rare, you know, 0.01% of our cases are demonic. Most of the time it is, and we, we wanna make sure that people understand that. We're not ghost adventures. We're not out there saying everything is demonic. You know, that's mm -hmm. ridiculous, no it's not. I, I'll be honest, I have a ton of cases that I have gotten that have come from people who got other teams to come do an investigation and then stir everything up and have no idea what they're doing. And then they just mm. leave because they don't know how to fix it, you know? And um, going back to the tools, one of the things that I use that a lot of teams I've met don't use, I'm sure a lot of the people here in, in with the Warren foundation, they know all this. I use a singing bowl to cleanse energy in the home. Cause a lot of times it's just bad energy in the house. You know, you'll find out people are arguing with each other a lot. There's a lot of energy mm -hmm. in there. And a lot of times it can be fixed just by cleansing the energy. You know, it's and, you know, what Chris was talking about with everybody thinking it's demons. We a lot of times I'll tell them on the phone when I first talk to them, just so you know, there's most likely nothing there that's going to harm you. It's demons are very rare. They're, it's not as much as you think. And it calms them down a lot. Because a lot of times nobody wants to believe them. Everybody thinks they're crazy. They have nobody to right. talk to. You know, we're the first people that will listen to them. Mm -hmm. And it makes for boring movies. All you see are the, the worst cases of paranormal activity. You don't see just the bad energy and the things like that that most people would live with. So, I mean, of course your brain is going to go there. And 
you know what? I understand the TV shows. I watch them. You know, mm-hmm. I know Chris doesn't. I, <laughs> I watch them from time to time. They're entertaining, but people have to take that as that's what it is. It's entertaining. I mean, if I've been out to places in an abandoned prison for five hours with four people and 14 cases of equipment and captured zero, that's not yeah. going to make a good TV show. So I understand why the TV does it, but it confuses a lot of people out there. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, they take reality television seriously, and it's anything but in most cases. It's not reality. It's scripted reality. Uh, but it, like you said, it sells advertising. I'm, I'm in a ton of Facebook groups that are all paranormal stuff. And I do go in there and spend some time trying to help people and trying to educate people. I get a lot of cases from them, too. Mm-hmm. But I go in there for that. And you would, you would be amazed when somebody posts the video of, oh, I captured an orb in my house. And, and then I'm never rude. I always go in and I, I detailed explanation. This is why you got that. It's not paranormal. Here's what happened. I'm very detailed with them. And I will get trashed in there telling them, I have no idea what I'm doing. Obviously, I've never investigated, but they know because they saw Zach on Ghost Adventures say this was an orb or something. And it amazes me that they believe those people over people who really do this every day in in something where we don't charge a dime to anybody. Yeah. You know? I think it makes for more interesting conversation. That that would be the only reason for them to believe that over, over you guys having such experience with this and not charging but i don't know it's cool to be haunted now everybody yeah. wants to be haunted everybody wants to capture a ghost it's it's cool they go on tiktok and they can post their thing and you know so i i think that's what it is and and when they do get one they're gonna you know regret <laughs> yeah regret wanting it there well we were we were talking about this uh my wife and i when we were preparing for this interview uh the different types of you know, preconceptions with this stuff because you have movies like Sixth Sense, The Others, um, you know, where the people that are are there in that that other plane, they don't know their their past. So, you know, they're not evil. They're not evil at all. And it's like you have other other movies where it's like, you know, these are evil forces and that sort of thing. You know, like um, I think it was in, in Poltergeist. Not only did they have the spirit, but then it manifested. You know, right. how how often or how rare does that actually happen? Has anyone in the in the group here ever seen anything like that where there are actual manifestations? Yes. I, yeah. I've times. been attacked. I've been picked up and thrown across the room when I was 350 pounds. I've been scratched, bitten, punched by unseen forces. But you know what? You got to get up, dust yourself off and say, is that all you got? Because somebody's got to do this work. Somebody right. has to stand up to these things. You know, I've been in a bed with my cousin, you know, a poltergeist case that picked up, flew across the room, broke, uh, slammed down and broke into pieces. I've been in a home where the whole house shook from pounding, where the um, where the woman was clawed in front of me, where a mm-hmm. pot full of holy church incense flew across the room and straight at my head. Um, where two hulking black shapes came down the stairs and stared at us. And then as I'm running to the front door to try to get the hell out because I'm 16 year old, years old, terrified, the door won't open, the lights are going on and off, and then the uh, chair I was just sitting in tumbles across the room at me. So, mm. yeah, poltergeist phenomena is very real. Um, oddly, it's far more common in Europe and the United States, in North America, than it is in places like South America or Africa or Asia, where they tend to use um, magic. And so that same energy seems to be far more directed. I'm not a fan of the idea of magic. To me, it's quantum physics. Um, But the idea being, because it's directed, it is more focused, and therefore we don't get that wild out of control thing. Whereas in Western society, we don't have that same uh, feeling anymore about magic. We don't practice it as much. Mm-hmm. So we get this out of control energy, which be, manifests as poltergeist phenomena. At least that's my theory. Well, I mean, well, that's, it's a good theory. And, and I would actually, you, you give me an idea about this, though, because 
when it comes to that energy, where does it come from? First of all, I mean, it's it's there, but how does it get so strong that it can then manifest itself to be able to cause that damage, that physical damage? Is that are, do we enable it to get stronger through our negative energy or our mm -hmm. how does that work? It feeds off negative energy and it feeds off our fear. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I one case comes to mind. I was trying to help a family. It was uh, two sisters. Um, uh, their mother had passed away about a year before in the home. Two sisters inherited the house. They lived together. One sister had little children and a husband who was an alcoholic. And there was a lot of animosity and I'm going to say hatred in the home. The, 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 the husband and the, and the sister-in-law hated each other. And I remember the first time I went out there, I witnessed it firsthand. And I said, listen, I said to her, Unless you guys can lo learn to love one another and come together as a family, there's nothing I'm going to be able to do for you. Whatever is here is feeding off of that. And, uh, you know, it, it was we, we, we did everything we could. Uh, the, the house was finally sold. However, the entity followed them. Hmm. And followed we found out it, it followed the people. Yeah, oh. followed them to their next home. And I found out that the daughter was into black magic, the 14-year-old daughter was into black magic and uh, using a Ouija board with her friends. I didn't know that previously because she kept, she kept it from us. Mm. You know, mm. uh, even the mother didn't know. So I didn't blame the, the, the aunt or the mother. But um, that case, we worked on that case for about four years. Mm. At the, and they moved three or four times before we were, I believe we were successful in getting rid of it because to this day, I believe they're fine. This, this had, I think this was back in 2011. So we're talking about 11 years ago. Well, we worked on the case for, uh, I think, 2008 through 2011. Just going back and forth. I couldn't even get the priest to go out there. Their parish priest was going to meet us there one night. He said, look, just, you know, wipe the priest over, have pizza, whatever, mm -hmm. have him bless the house. Uh, he called me about an hour before we were supposed to be there. He's like, I, I can't make it. And mm -hmm. he didn't elaborate as to why, but I could tell. Like, I could hear the, vo the fear in his voice. And, and people ask me, why is the priest so scared? He's a priest. I'm like, listen, priests are people first. You yeah. know, just, a, you know, and I, I had a priest in a, in a house in Meriden, Connecticut that did show up and he was blessing the house and the room that we felt was the epicenter of the activity. He, he walked in the room and he blessed the room and said some prayers, spread the holy water. And instead of turning around and walking out like he did whatever other room, he backed out of the room. And I'm empathic myself, and I could feel the energy building up, and I could see and feel the fear in this priest. So he backed out of the room into the hallway because I was right behind him. And he walked back in, blessed the room again, and he said, I have to leave. He just abruptly just left. And I could tell he was terrified. Yeah, so I, I can see why, so but... Then at the same time, like we were saying, that strengthens that energy, though, correct? I mean, the anger is just as powerful it's as safe as fear. Powerful as fear. For me, fear is a denial of faith. Hmm. And if somebody is afraid, that means they really don't believe strong <laughs> enough. Um, and faith isn't what people seem to think it is. You know, faith isn't everything's going to turn out fine. No. Faith is, regardless of what happened here, me here, I'm part of God's plan. I have faith God, that God's plan is correct. And whatever happens, yeah. I know my soul will be okay. That's faith. And that's what protects you in these cases. It doesn't matter what your religion is. As far as I can tell, every religion in the world has exorcism rights. Every religion in the world has ways of cleansing a home. It's all about faith. It's all about your personal connection to God. And whatever your particular path to God is, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. As long as you're seeking that spiritual connection. And I think Sorry. when I go I into go cases out. that may be... Uh, when, I, when I go into cases that may be evil, demonic in nature, you know, I have... You know... I, I have an, I guess I say an attitude problem with that mm -hmm. because the way I see it in my faith is I am a child of God who was made in his image. We all are. Okay. Now, Ed Warren said to me on more than one occasion, he goes, 
Yeah, God is stronger than any demon or any devil, but no man is. Remember that line, Chris? That's very true. No, I'm just a mortal man. Okay, but in my in my belief, I was made in God's image. I am his, you know, I am his subject. I'm here doing his work. Okay, you can't defeat me. And these things hide from me because they don't want anything to do with me. Not that they can't beat the crap out of me. You know, like I said, I've been punched, scratched, bitten, you know, thrown across the room. I've had bottles of two liter bottles of soda almost hit me in the face and chairs stacking on one another. You know, I've experienced a lot of stuff in 36 years. But, you know, and, and am I scared? Absolutely. I'm human. Of course I'm scared. All right. But, but Chris hit the nail on the head. Your faith is what guides you through. Okay. Mm -hmm. You wear a crucifix around your neck. Okay. It's nothing <coughs> but a piece of metal unless you believe in what that stands for. The Bible, the Holy Bible, it's just a book with pages in it. Unless you believe in the words written in that Bible, what it stands for. You hang a crucifix on the wall. It's just a piece of metal or a piece of wood. You need to have faith in what that the protection that that offers, you know, and, and, and that's an old line from the movie Miracle on 34th Street that I always coin is faith is believing it's something that common sense tells you not to. It's something that's not tangible. It comes from within, you know, so and whatever your particular faith is, there's there's always help for you. There's, there's no nothing's ever hopeless. And, and this this type of work, if you want to say it, is. It's not for everyone, you know, yeah. it's, it's really not. I mean, when, when I started, like I was saying, there wasn't a lot out there. So I used to just kind of do it on my own, not, not for residential, but just out in general, trying to learn more, trying to investigate a little bit. When I was asked to be on a, a case, an actual residential case, I was all excited. It was in like 91, I think it was. And it was just some people I knew they had a guy that was sick and they needed an extra person. I had never been on a residential case. I was all excited to go. It turned out to be a demonic case, my first ever residential case where the guy got attacked right in front of me, scratched from the top of his neck to the, the bottom of his spine. And, you know, I guess I was meant to do this because 30-something <laughs> years later, I'm still doing this. Most people would have run and never come back from that first, you know, experience. Well, but, the thing uh, is, is, it is a it is a true service that you're providing with this with this endeavor it's it's got to be the hardest thing when you when you meet with people and you see the pain that they're in and sometimes you're powerless to help them at that moment you know that you can get there but that's got to be a hard a hard walk with them you, you know it is you, you do get kind of attached sometimes to some of these cases especially if there's kids involved but i will say this and i don't know if anybody else agrees <coughs> with me the things that to me have been the hardest to deal with are when you have a person or a family that refuses to accept it's not paranormal. Oh yeah. It, to me, it's the hardest thing because no matter what, you cannot, you cannot help them at that point. If they don't want to understand and learn and listen, uh, they're, they're not, they're not ready for that help. That's just my opinion. I mean, you know, of course, no, none of us want to really get into a demonic case and, and, you know, endanger ourselves. But dealing with people like that, it, it sometimes you get families that the minute you tell them something like that, they are so relieved to hear that, mm -hmm. that there's nothing paranormal. But then there's some people that just will not accept it because there's a, a lot of times we do deal with psychiatric illnesses mm -hmm. and it people like going back to what Joe just said about that last case. It's very important that people be 100% honest with us and tell us everything because we do not judge them. Because if we don't know those things, we can't help them. Like, it, they, a lot of them won't tell us that they were maybe diagnosed with a psychiatric illness or taking a medication for an illness. Because right away we're going to think, well, that's the problem, you're crazy. And that's not the case. Because a lot of times people with illnesses like that actually make them more susceptible. So it can be both, but they have to be willing to tell us everything and be honest, so, you know, or else they're not going to get help. You guys agree with that? Yeah, with a you, lot of people, you guys really I feel have to be the, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to comment that a lot of <coughs> with a lot of people, um, things are psychosomatic, I believe. 
you know, one of the first questions I ask is, how many of these TV shows do you watch? How many of these movies? Oh, geez, we love them. We, we, I'm like, do you have a particular favorite? I, I don't care to watch them because they're phony, in my opinion. Some of them are pretty well done, but they're, but they're phony. They, they don't truly depict how an investigation happens. You can't jam a, a three- or four-year investigation into a half-hour or an hour show. Right. Okay, and then at the end of the right. show, oh, the family's fine now. No, they're not fine. And, you know, I, I, when I lecture, I get groups in the audience that are part of a paranormal team. And you can tell because they're all wearing the T-shirts and stuff. And, and I'm not knocking that before I get in trouble with the, with the viewers, you know. But you, you have to do it this professionally. And, you know, as someone alluded to earlier, I think it was Chris, that they, they get in over their heads. They're, they're just thrill seekers. Mm -hmm. I had a colleague say to me just a couple of weeks ago, oh, Joe, I, I've, I've always wanted to be touched or or struck by an unseen force. I'm like, why? I said, and no, you don't. You know, I'm I, when 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 my phone's not ringing or my my email's not pinging with you know members of the foundation looking for for my help or my guidance. I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy. That means all is well, or at least you know yeah. as far as our cases go. You know, I said, you why would you want that? You know, the, the, it's the thrill of the hunt. You know, the, the, the thrill seekers, they want something to happen. Yeah. You know, uh, to, to seeing what Bill said earlier, these people want something to happen so bad that when you say, hey, there's nothing here, they get mad at you. Yeah. They're like, no, 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 really, really. I had a psychic here. Yeah. How much did you pay him? Oh, they only charged me $500. I'm like, oh, God. You know, they cleared, they cleared the house for me. I'm like, <laughs> oh, can't fix stupid. Yeah. You know, it, it's I, very frustrating. It's very frustrating. I, I have to chime in here because um, we recently had a case where a woman was told she had a demon and then the team ran away. So she started shopping around trying to get help and she went to this online church and he charged her, I believe it was $600 each time he went and tried to cleanse her at his church. Mm -hmm. And she had to keep coming back again and again and again. Completely ridiculous. If you're being charged for help, these are not reputable people as far as I'm concerned. Yep. We do what we do yep. for free. The predators. It's God's work. And the truth is we're going to ask you nine times out of ten for a psych evaluation or medical evaluation, depending on what the information is you present to us. Because one thing I've learned from terrifying experience is there's always an underlying reason why you are vulnerable and not someone else. And if we don't deal yeah. with that underlying yeah. vulnerability, then regardless of our spiritual cleansings, yeah, it'll get rid of it for a little while. But as Joe was saying, we've got a problem here with this young lady in his case that he worked on for four years because mm -hmm. she was practicing black magic. It probably improved when she got old enough that she outgrew that. Yeah. You know, I don't know because I don't remember this particular case that well. But the point being, you have to deal with whatever it is that's in the problem, the problem, not just the problem itself. Right. 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 It's like you tell me what happened. So I know what's happening because you're telling me. I want to know why it's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is this happening? Are you into black magic? You're playing with Ouija boards? Someone having seances, you know, well, you know, you really got to get, you, you know, like a root cause analysis. Ask the question why five times. Yeah. You know, well, why are the cover cupboards flying open? Why this? Why that? You got to really dig down, and that takes a lot of hard work and investigative uh, mm -hmm. ability. You know, you don't just go in there with your cameras and start clicking pictures and say, "I'm here for four hours." Oh, I'm tired now. I'm going to go home. I didn't capture anything. It doesn't work yeah. that way. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, a lot of them don't want to tell you certain things like we're saying, but yet, you know, like I've seen, I've had people get completely offended with me when we asked them about psychiatric and, and medical records and saying, mm -hmm. you know, but what's funny is they think it's a demon at that point. And if you really had to get an exorcism through, say, the Catholic Church to be sanctioned, they have to have medical reports and psychiatric right. evaluations before they could even actually sanction it. So, I mean, you know, we're just trying to help them, but a lot of people just, you know, they're, they're afraid. They don't want to tell us, you know, 
Yeah. yeah. Gonna... And a lot of times I'd imagine times people sure. don't know what they don't know. I don't know. Right. Education right. is a big part of what we do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm an exorcist and I've worked on over 10,000 cases in my career and I've only done six or seven exorcisms. They're incredibly rare, incredibly yeah. rare. And I've yet, and yeah, I've met people who say they've done 300 this year. And I'm like, are you out of your friggin' minds? Like a Did you do psych evaluations? No. Well, then how do you know they needed help? Did what were they presenting that seemed totally over the top paranormal? And and how do you know it wasn't out of psychic and psychic abilities and not an actual entity entering them and taking them over? It 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 is the height of your responsibility, and. The, the terrifying part is most of these people don't understand that they're dealing with other people's lives. I've had two cases where people have died because they were under possession. And that is not something that people should take lightly. I, I've, I've seen it, like I was saying in those groups, I saw somebody post something and somebody came in and commented because, you know, again, a lot of them don't know and they say oh that's definitely demonic in your house and then the person that posted it responded oh wow that would be really cool <laughs> uh, no it wouldn't <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, you can say that all you want but believe me no it wouldn't <laughs> yeah that's the last really thing cool. you want yeah. well people love this subject okay i get uh, my lectures i get people that say geez I, i'm fascinated by what you do but i don't want anything to happen anything to do with it myself and i've actually people said yeah. am i going to bring something home with me just because i was at your one of your lectures and i'm like no mm. you know it doesn't work that way but you know like chris said i i try to educate yep. you know uh you know and, and 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 i i will say i've never had an empty seat in the house but you know what we present and my colleagues here present it's it's exciting, yes. It's educational, but it's better than any movie you're going to go pay fifteen bucks to see, right? You know, if you're interested with the su in the subject, and especially if you're an investigator or a would-be up-and-coming investigator, you know, you should come to one of these lectures and listen yeah. to the people that have been doing it. You know, because I was once where they were. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. but you have to do your homework. But a lot of people they don't want to do the 35, 40 years of research. They want instant fame and and, and, and notoriety. And, right. you know, and they try to latch on to your coattails. Lorraine, remember, Lorraine and I had a conversation once where she was upset the fact that a lot of people would go to her events and have their pictures taken with her. And she was such a kindly, saint, saintly old lady, you know. And then they would th throw those pictures all up all over the social media and say, oh, I know Lorraine Warren. I'm like, no, you don't know. You, you met, met her, her at a function. Second. You took your pictures, with, you know. But they try to use that, you know, name dropping to right. And it's happened to me too, you know. But I'm sure it's happened to these gentlemen as well. <laughs> and it drives you crazy, but there's not much you can do about it, you know. But uh, it, it it would drive me crazy that, or if you get someone who says, "Well, I've been doing this for you know 25 years," I'm like. You've actually been doing this for 25 years, or you've just been interested in it for 25 years. There's a big difference. Yeah. You know, right. when I when I interview people, I'll give them a scenario, and um, I'll say, "What would you do if you were in a home, you're in, and all of a sudden all hell broke loose, and the cabinets flew open, and the dishes started flying at you, and you almost get hit in the head with a bottle of soda, you know, or you got picked up and thrown across the room?" And I had one person actually say, "Well, I, w I wouldn't run out of the house." Like, yeah, damn liar. <laughs> and I said, these aren't just examples. These are things that actually happened to me. I'm right. sure it's happened to Bill and it's her, I'm sure it's happened to Chris. I'm like, I want you to tell me what you would do. What do you think you would do? Because it's never happened to you. I said, you'd probably soil yourself. I'm trying to keep it clean here for our audience. Yeah. You'd probably soil yourself. Be honest with me. Now, if you said that, I'd have more respect for you than to say, well, I wouldn't run out of the house. Yeah. That happened to me on my first case. I'm down the street before you can blink an eyelash, you know. One hundred percent, because I'll see people post videos from TikTok and things like that, and they'll tag me in it to to see what I believe. Do you think this is fake? Do you think this is real? And most of them are, you know, videos of watching people filming it, the doors flying open, and 
And I said, 100% fake. They would not be standing there filming it if it was really happening. It would be yeah. running out of the house. There's no way that they would just be standing there going, oh, my God, look what's going on. The door's closing. The door's open. Never. You'd be running out. There's no way. <laughs> That's how you can tell if it's real or fake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The real stuff is is scary. I, I know that for a fact. Because my wife has actually lived through stuff like that in in her mom's house. You know, the real stuff you don't stick around for. Right. It, it's funny if you had, they come to the lectures and you know, we we're also gonna do some stuff that isn't just lectures, just kind of stories and things like that. People love watching movies that are based on the true story. Come listen to some of our stories. They're yeah. not based on anything. They're they're real. <laughs> Can we look forward to any of that at, at Phantasm? Yeah, uh, we have a we have a lot of panels actually. All of us. Um, yeah. I have some that are you know one is talking about public investigations. One's about uh, residential investigations. One is a, a just a pure question and answer that we're all going to be in. Um, and then we have a few other ones that we're going to throw in there. I'm working on them right now that are just going to be some stories of some of the craziest things we've all seen and, and Ooh. things like that. We, we have a lot of stuff there. Uh, I hope I can get to see it. If not, I'm going to have to send someone to, to, to tape it for us or something. Can I that go would... and then I'll FaceTime you and let you watch from my bed Sure. Sure. With like or something. <laughs> see, my, my bride, uh, producer lady, she's going to have all the fun. I got to stay. All the fun my ass. I never get to go do anything. <laughs> But we are really looking forward to it. Um, I know we're a little bit over, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. A lot, uh, a lot over. But uh, <laughs> if each of you could leave our, our viewers with uh, with some closing thoughts, you know, as far as if they're going through something like this, or if they think they might have gone through it in the past, just some, some word for them. Who wants to start? Joe? Oh, I'll go. So for anybody that thinks they're going through something or really wants help, they should contact us. And like I said, be willing to just be open. And, and everybody here at the foundation, is, we can help them. We just need them to be honest with us, tell us what's going on, and, and understand we're not going to judge them. Now, if anybody wants to get into this side to be an actual investigator, I would say come to our lectures, things like that, and listen and learn, get educated. If you want to go out and do public stuff in, in the cemetery and, and whatever, that's fine. But before you go into somebody's home, you need to be with somebody who's been doing that for a while that can help guide you before you go into somebody's home because then you're playing with people's lives. Mm -hmm. And also, I see the, the things on the bottom. Also, the Warren warrenlegacy.com, they could reach us there too. Uh, for you know, if you're having trouble or you want to be part of the team, either way, you can reach us there also. Right. Well, let me thank you again, gentlemen, for for taking time out of your uh, middle of the week. But I can't wait to see you guys at Phantasm. I hope it's been educational. And I admit, sometimes I don't know the questions to ask because you don't know what you don't know. But your stories are absolutely fascinating, and I appreciate you sharing them online. And here with us, uh, it's it's been very educational. So I do appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Absolutely, and I'll see you in, in like nine days. <laughs> yes. Yes. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it as well. Thank you very much for letting us come on. Yes, and safe trip for you coming back from Peru. Peru. Thank you. Looking forward to it. It's been a long All time right. since I've been in the states. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of, of you that are in the Orlando area, again, the, uh, the convention we've been speaking about today is Phantasm Orlando. It's at phantasmofficial.com. And uh, I believe we have a graphic that we can put up for it. Um, I know it's, it's really close to the event. We're days away. But if you haven't planned your, your trip yet, um, I know that there are still some rooms available at the Doubletree. Um, check it out. It's the 19th through the 21st, so just a few days away. Uh, the panels are going to be absolutely phenom phenomenal. You saw evidence of that with, uh, you know, our friends from uh, Purse and the Warren Foundation. 
there is going to be no end to information in that. And just have an open mind and come and listen to these stories because I know what I found in research was just unbelievable. Um, so, yeah, it's a very exciting and deep show, I know. And we don't even have Boris here um, to lighten it all up because normally he'll come in and he'll he'll give the zingers. But, you know, the one thing that just sticks with me about this, because each of these guys is a man of faith and believes 100%. And they're doing this as a service. They're not making a lot of money at this. Um, look into what they're saying, because it's the people who don't charge that are usually the people that you should trust the most. They're not making money at this. You know, if you say, well, they're just making, no, they're not. So end of soapbox, but just have an open mind and look at what they're doing, because they're following in some pretty cool footsteps. And they're continuing it. It's the Legacy Foundation for a reason, the Warren Legacy Foundation. So, yeah, check it out. Um, anyway, uh, getting to the announcements, we have Phantasm Orlando, as we said, 19th through the 21st, Double Tree right across from Universal. If you're in the Orlando area, you got no excuse not to come. Uh, next up, we have the Halloween Family Vendor Show. Um, this benefits the Veteran Cemetery uh, Restoration Group. Um, they really do a beautiful job in taking those old cemetery uh, plots, cleaning them up, repairing damage. Um, it's for a good cause. And they also support the veteran city. And that's October 29th. They're having a trunk or treat. They have a vendor's area inside the mall. Um, but we had the, the graphic up there. You can see that also on the Monster Manor page. Um, check that out. We're going to be there as well. Uh, next up, we have, uh, I know we haven't been talking about this one because it's it's more comic related and less horror, but Lake County Comic Con. It's from uh, formerly the Claremont Comic Con. It's a really good one day homegrown show. And uh, that's on November 20th. We don't have a graphic for that one yet, but November 20th at the Trilogy Orlando in Groveland, Florida. And that's lakecountycomiccon.com if you want to check that out. Uh, finally, coming up in December is KrampusCon, December 2nd through 4th, and that's at the International Palms Resort. Um, this is going to be an interesting show. Um, horror, yes. Christmas, yes. What else can you ask for? And that's in Cocoa Beach. And more information on that can be found at KrampusCon, with a K, dot com. Um, and I'm going to leave you with this. We are on Tingler Television now. We've had a great, great two weeks now. We have, have been on there uh, for two weeks. And thank you all for supporting us and coming out and joining the chat. Um, you know, there's been some confusion in where you can find it. I'm sorry I'm a little congested. We've had some, some sinus stuff going on here. Um, but let me tell you, these guys that are working, Tingler Television, are fantastic. They've gotten the word out there. They've upgraded the site and now broadcasting in high def. There's been some confusion on how to get it on your Roku or your Fire Stick. If you go to Roku or Fire Stick, all you have to do is download their internet, you know, browser. And then you can go straight to tinglertelevision.com. You can go right in there like you would on your on your desktop and watch whatever you want. You can join the chat room, all that stuff. And it's totally free entertainment. Um, and it's made by horror creators uh, that just knock knock it out of the park. I mean, Eulogy Mortem, uh, the, the, I haven't Tennessee seen a Macabre. stinker on it. The Tennessee Macabre, uh, I, I can't say his real name. I don't want to say his real name. But the guy has been very super helpful. Um, and everyone on this station just has a love for, for horror and, you know, having fun with it. There's a lot of camp, a lot of old drive-in type movies. So... It's uh, a lot of original content, too, like Monster Manor and some of the other shows on there. So check out their lineup um, and have some fun with it. And finally, if you like what we're doing here and you like the the path that we're going, um, you know, we always say, you know, don't don't go on TikTok and send gifts and stuff like that. We appreciate it. But, you know, you're, you're throwing your money into the wind. If you want to help out, get swag for it. You know, get something out of it. We have our Patreon where you get some really cool exclusive uh, swag. And then we have our Red Bubble Shop where you can get T-shirts, hats, bags, you name it. So if you want to support us, we would rather you get something out of it. So that's the way to do it. Um, but you can see some of the cool stuff. And everything on the site has been designed by yours truly. So nothing has been um, 
you know, copied and pasted from other things. So, but anyway, that is what we did tonight. We'll be back again on Friday. Um, we're going to have some fun with Nick Benson, special effects artist, and some of the movies that he was on, you might know, um, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, uh, Tremors, um, there's a whole slew, okay? The guy is fantastic. He's been doing this a long time. Society, uh, yeah, check him out. Friday, mm -hmm. 9 p.m. I'm excited to have him. <coughs> Excuse me. Held that in as long as I could. Um, but yeah, we are looking forward to seeing everyone back here. And again, to my special guests all tonight, thank you for coming together. It's always hard, you know, wrangling that many people. But I appreciate them coming on and sharing their gifts and uh, and their experiences with us. These are the real deal, guys. So thank you for coming on Monster Manor again. We thank you for watching, and we will see you Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, guys. You have created a monster and it will destroy you. She's alive! Alive! I am Dracula. Monster Kids, thanks for hanging out for another episode of Monster Manor. Do us a favor, though, and hit the bell to get reminders of when we add new content. Subscribe to our channel, and while you're waiting for new shows, check out our website at www.monstermanor1313.com. New content at least every other week, sometimes even more often. Like and follow our Facebook page as well for other content. And lastly, if you want to help us out, check out our Patreon in the Monster Manor with Scott Fenster. Thanks for hanging out until the end. <laughs>